Well, good morning. Good morning. My name is Caleb Lynch. If you're tuning in online, we love you. We miss you. And, um, and we are thankful to get to be here. We're thankful to get to be in this series uh, through Galatians. It has been a blessing and a today and uh, unfortunately we grieve with them so in solidarity we wear our black and then our dear friend Phil Mickelson Phil Mickelson come on he uh, at the age of 50 almost 51 years of age he is leading the PGA championship today and there are a bunch of young men behind him that will 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 beat him today and uh, and so because of that we mourn and we wear our black to celebrate our grieving with them Things in Jesus' name. What's that? Okay. Here's the thing. I really want him to win, and I believe he can win. We can. We believe with him, and we will. We believe. We believe. And some of you in this room are like, I have no idea anything he just talked about. <laughs> And that is the beautiful beauty of the church, is that we all come together as different as we are, and we get to talk about golf. Um, the, the plan of the devil from the beginning has, has always been to convince humanity that um, if, if, if they so choose, they, they could keep it together on their own. It's, it's always been the plan of the evil one to try to put the power into the hands of human beings. It's always been his plan. Um, he has many plans at play, but one that continues to rear its head is that man ultimately has the power to control his destiny in relationship to God Almighty. And the truth, is that we know that the power, the empowerment has not been man. The empowerment will always be found in the name of Jesus. And um, the devil would like us to believe something different. And he has continued from the garden till this day to try to convince us, the church and many others, that, um, that if you just get after it hard enough, if you just will it enough, if you just empower yourself and self-care yourself enough that you can save yourself. And um, the good news of the gospel is that there is only one who saves, and his name is Jesus Christ. And all of our hope, as we sang, is found in him and in no other name. Did you know that that was true? Amen. This has been an issue... In this time, in Galatians, what Paul is writing to is a group of people who once were freed because of the love of Christ and the goodness of Christ and the grace of Christ and the freedom found in his name, freedom that came out from under the law and into grace, and now they are falling back under a law, a system of regulations. Um, the early church fought this battle the whole way through uh, until uh, the really the Roman Empire um, created this thing called Catholicism. And Roman Catholics, for over a thousand years, um, hid the beauty of the gospel, the true gospel, that faith and salvation are found alone in Christ Jesus, not by works, but alone in Christ Jesus. And not, not more than just 500 years ago has the church began to reclaim the reality that hope, salvation, is found in Christ alone. It was these guys called the Reformers. It was the Reformation. Guys like Calvin, guys like Luther, guys like Wesley. They, at one point, started actually opening up their Bible 
and they discovered books like Galatians. They discovered books like Romans. And there were books and verses and thoughts and concepts and truths and principles flooded through those pages to the point where they said, we can't unread these words. We can't unread these words. If these words are true, then the way in which we have been interpreting Scripture, God, and humanity, we have missed it. And there has been a fight and urge ever since to reclaim the good news of the gospel, that salvation is found in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And the evil one, all the while, would love to continue to make sure that we believe, that the church believes, that, um, that there is something that we can do to save ourselves. And so even today, as we speak this message today, as we, as we talk through these verses today, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of pastors across the nation preaching um, something contrary to the good news that we find in the gospel, which is Christ alone saves. Christ alone saves. Do you believe me? What we're going to see today, um, if you've been with us, what we've been looking at is Paul. He's writing to these churches, but he's been doing an, a fantastic job of outlining a bunch of different things, really diving deep into some theological understandings of, of grace and love and God and freedom and, and salvation through Christ alone, not by works of the law. He's, he's unpacking a ton, and he's going to just slightly shift gears today with where we're at, and this is, all of a sudden, he's laid out some really beautiful concepts, and he's going to continue to lay out some beautiful concepts, but in this moment, you're going to see a man who truly, in his pastoral heart, in his love for these people, is going to plea with them, is going to plea with them to say, please return back to the truth. Please return back to this reality of Christ and in Christ. And, and what we're going to see because of it, he's going to outline a couple of things, but one of the things we're going to see is we're going to see this difference between what relationships look like under law, under rule, under formation of structure systems, and what relationships of love and grace through Christ Jesus look like. We're going to see some contrast. And so I want you looking for that. As you're reading how Paul describes his relationship with these churches in Galatia, I want you to look for, is that is he describing a relationship or, or an outpouring of a relationship because of something that has been done under the law? Or is he, is he describing something that has been done under grace, under in Christ Jesus? Does that make sense, what I'm asking you to look for? What we will see is that when Jesus is at the center, there is grace. When law is at the center, there is division. Sometimes the Bible, when you read through it, when you teach through it, Sometimes it gives you these direct truths, these statements, these undeniable verses where you're like, that's just a flat-out theological doctrine statement. And other times what you get is you get principles of life because of the reality of those truth statements. What we're going to see more today is principle understandings of life in Christ than we are going to see these doctrinal, theological sound, strong statements. Does that make sense? You staying with me? Tracking? Okay. This is just an intro. We're just introing this all here. We're going to be fine. Um, someone asked me this two weeks ago. And uh, I, don't, I don't know that I gave a great answer, so if you were the one that asked me, I apologize. Um, the, the question that was posed was something along these lines of, what, what's the big deal? Why are we fighting so hard against the law? Why are we fighting so hard against this rule keeping? Isn't it just okay? They love God and they just, they just want to do what's right. Just let, let them do the law thing. Why is Paul so aggravated that these people just want to follow the ways of Jesus why, why, or the ways of God. Why not just let them try to be good and they love Jesus and, and what's the big deal? What's the big deal is the question. What is the big deal? It's a valid, that's a valid question, right? 
What is the big deal? What you will see in the next few verses is that it's a really big deal. That something gets produced when you create a religion around rule keeping, around law-based systems, versus when you create a religion or a belief system around love, around grace, around the goodness of Christ Jesus himself. You're going to see some differences of what gets poured out, what gets pushed out, what gets nudged out. And it's a big deal. Because you see, these truths that save us, that salvation is found in believing in Jesus, not by some works, they are foundational to that concept, but they actually have outflowing into our daily relationships and daily lives that make a difference in the way we see life, we see each other, we see God, we see the way that we move and live. They're not just concepts to get us home, they're concepts that change the very way in which we see all things. He starts with this phrase, verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. Remember, the, the, the Galatians, they, they weren't under Jewish law. They weren't under the Ten Commandments. They weren't under the, the laws of Leviticus. They, they, they didn't live under that system. They lived under what would be defined at that time as a pagan system. It still had laws. It still had rules. It still had uh, what he'll use in a phrase, elementary, basic rules of life. Right? If you do this, you get this. If you do that, you get this. If you're living in this existence and you have this ailment, it's because you probably did this. They still had their system. It was still a system of a law, but it was not a system grounded in anything of the nature that, that are God's. This is the fundamental principle for anyone who is not in a covenant relationship with Yahweh, the God of the universe who has been revealed to us in Christ Jesus, it is always, circle that word, in slavery, enslaved. All other systems, listen to me, listen to me, all other systems, all other religions, all other man-made ideological systems of our time are all meant to put you under something else. Only in Christ Jesus do we get promised freedom. Isn't that crazy? It's the only system in which we are offered freedom. Fact check me on that one. And no matter what system you are under, you will be driven and motivated to meet its demands. Remember, uh, we'll get to it, so we won't spoil it now. I think our, our buddy Caleb Smith gets to teach on this one, but the verse is, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. What Paul is eagerly and, and longing to do often and time and time again is move you positionally from slave to son or daughter. Know that. He, he's just got done talking about how you are heirs, how you are part of the family of God now. He is constantly trying to move you from a position of slavery to a position of sonship. And that is a, that is a concept that you want to let roll around in your head quite some time. It's, it's, a, it's a position of living from, not living for. You know what I'm saying by that? Living from his love, not living for his love. He's constantly trying to push us into that space. So Caleb, are you saying that as long as I am in Christ, I am free to do whatever I want? Literally, like whatever I want. The, the, the answer, do you know the answer to that question? Is yes. But do you know the real answer is no. What? Romans 6, read it, memorize it. It is maybe one of the most foundational concepts of what it means to live under grace, what it means to live under the law of Christ Jesus, what it means to come under his way, to come under his governing. Romans 6, 14 says, you are no longer under law, 
but you are under grace. What does that mean? We need to be careful when we start having conversations like this. One of the reasons is there are, there are um, what is described as two very large camps in the world of what we would call evangelical Christianity. Uh, there are many camps, but there are, there are some that like to put the church of uh, the evangelical church into really two split places. They would call one is legalism. They would say one of the primary motivations of, of the pastors and the teachers of these churches is, is a system called legalism, which is essentially saying based off following the rules of God, the moral standards of law, is how you gain right standing with the Lord. And it's this putting you under some law system. And then the other one would be called antinomianism. Have you ever heard that phrase, antinomianism? And what this phrase is saying is that they would say many new covenant grace-based churches are going to teach a concept that is called antinomianism. And what this means is that uh, essentially that because Christ fulfilled the law and died to the law and replaced us from under the law, that we are no longer bound by the law and we can sin and we can do whatever we want. We are free in the name of Christ Jesus. And that's true. And it's not true. Let me explain. Both of those systems are using the law to determine who they are. Do you understand? Both are using the law to determine who they are. One is saying, I'm bound by the law. And the other one is saying, I'm not bound by the law. Still using the law to define their existence. The truth is, for those of us who have been found in Christ Jesus, we are under what we would call the law of Christ. We look to him. We no longer look to the law to determine who we are. We look to Christ Jesus. We look to him who, who, who is there and who has done the work, but we also look to him who is in here. The law of Christ is not an extensive list of legal codes. It is a law of love. Read Romans 6. Freedom in Christ is not there so that you can go around abusing the law. Freedom in Christ is that, is that you are no longer under the burden of the law. And that the law no longer condemns you. But the burden, that fell on Christ. And the condemnation, that fell on Christ. So that in Christ Jesus, listen to this, you actually have the power to now keep the things of the law. Listen, if you are in Christ Jesus, if he is in you, if you have been fused with him, do you, do you know that you love him? Do you know that the, the deepest part of your soul loves the Lord because he has been fused with you? Do you know that because you love the Lord, you, you actually love what he has to say? And that you love his word and that you love the things that he has outlined in his way? That is what it means to be fused with him is that now his law has been written on, his, on your heart. Is this making sense? I'm 11, maybe 12 years old. And um, I'm, I, if, you, if you had met me a while ago, even if you meet me now, ap apart from me preaching on a stage, I'm, I'm kind of an introverted, a little bit insecure, a little bit quiet um, person. And, and a, a little bit like when I was younger, I was a lot more like scared at life and a little bit more fragile and, um, and then there was this girl, and she was about the same age as me, and she was wild and crazy and fun and outgoing and beautiful, and everyone wanted to be around her, and I was literally captivated, the word captivated is like enslaved, <laughs> by her, by her beauty, by her person, by by, by the ideals of who she was. Like, I would just watch her and watch her and watch her. And I was like, I should have been scared of her, but I was like, in, in like I was literally captivated by her. And time went on, and I, I made sure that I was near her, and we, we became boyfriend and girlfriend, and I found out that she actually loved me. Like, that she deeply loved me. Me. This weird, insecure self-centered, like shy, 
she loved me. And uh, I found out even more years later that she's continued to love me, even though I just, I'm a, like a mess at times, and she loves me. And, um, and I'm convinced at this point that love's not going away, no, no matter what I do. Isn't that crazy? No matter what I do, I know she loves me. What happens when that happens, I, I am enslaved to her love. I am caught in bondage by her love. I can't, I can't escape it, and, and I don't really desire to escape it. I, I don't desire to escape it. And because of it, now, do I have the freedom? Is she going to continue to love me if I mess up? Yeah, she's going to continue to love me. So I have the freedom to go and mess up, right? I'm the most free that I've ever been in the arms of her love, as free as I've ever been. I'm no longer trying to win her approval or win her love as much as she would like me to continue to try those things and, and the flowers and things. But I'm not in that position anymore. I still do. I love dating my wife. I love lavishing her with gifts and loving on her. But, but I, that's, I, I'm not trying to win her love any longer. So do I have the freedom now to take advantage of her love? I actually do. Right? Like I could go sin against her and she would continue to love me, which is crazy, but she would. But I can't. I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it. Because I have been literally enslaved by her love. And that is exactly what is true of us in Christ Jesus. Do you, do you see the difference? Do you see the difference of, of this new system, this new way? Hmm. Hmm. I'll tell you this about my wife. Um, I, just, I just like having her around. I feel more alive. I feel more safe. And she knows that about me. And so oftentimes she comes with me to meetings and staff meetings and sits in here. She knows the days just before we got up there. She could tell I wasn't right. And she looks into my eyes. I, I need her. She's the most safe place for me, and she's the most free place for me. And uh, I find that true in my Savior as well, is that he knows me, and I'm safely found in him, and that's the beautiful gift of being found in Christ. Look what he says. Look what he says. But now that you have come to know God, circle these next words, or rather to be known by God, how... how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world who slave you and want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. Hmm. Have you ever read 1 Corinthians 8.3? It says this, But if anyone loves God... He is known by God. Isn't that an astounding statement? If anyone has chosen to come under God, to love him, to, to pursue him, it says these words, it says that he is known by God. What defines us in Christ is not most profoundly that we have come to know him, but that he took note of us and that he made us his own. That's unbelievable. Like, like, let that sink in for a second. The God, there's one of them, he rules everything. In him, all things hold together. He is the beginning and the end all at once. Right? Like, that's crazy, first of all. He's the beginning, and he intimately knows you. He desires to intimately know you. The greatest miracle is not that we have intimate knowledge of him, but that he has chosen to have intimate knowledge of us. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And he's just pleading with them. He's saying, are you kidding me right now? The God of the universe is intimately involved 
with your story, with who you are. You've been known by him. You know him, and he knows you, and he's deeply involved with you. And you're going to go back to a system that says the way in which God knows you is by some acts of your own behavior? Are you kidding me? He's saying, I know you just as you are, and I desire to be intimately involved with you just as you are because of what Christ Jesus has done, because you have chosen to put your trust in me. And now you're saying you want to go back into a system where you have to rely on your own efforts and behavior to be known by God? Are you kidding me? Come on, guys. That's what he's saying. He's saying, please, come on. And then he continues, and he says in verse 11, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that I have labored over you in vain. Brothers, he says, I entreat you, become as I am, for I have also become as you are, and you did me no wrong. What's he saying here? First of all, he's saying, I'm afraid that all the work I did when I was with you was, was for naught. Like, do, you see, do, you know, do you know he's, he's speaking today out of a position of brokenheartedness? You, you'll see it in a second. It's hard to, it's hard to read it when we, when we try to redefine the words and reinterpret them. It's a little hard to read, but he's, he's not, in this moment, he's not angry. He's been angry. We heard him say some things, a little angry. He's not angry right now. He's literally brokenhearted. He loves these people. And he says, I'm just afraid that all that work, all that time we spent, all that truths we unpacked, that, that it was just for naught. And then he, then he says a really interesting statement. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. What is he saying? He, he's, not, he's not asking them to mimic him. He, he kind of does say that at other times in Scripture. I don't think he's asking that here. He's saying, you guys, understand the concept that I have come to know. The system in which I live under is this system of freedom found in Christ Jesus, not under the law. And then he says, look, I came like you. I became like you. Remember, I was once Jewish, and I had to follow all these rules, all these systems, all these regulatory laws, and I literally, I became like you. I shed those off. I realized that in Christ Jesus, those no longer mattered, that, that there was not Greek or Gentile or Jew, that we were all one in Christ Jesus. I shedded all of that off. I became like you. Become like me now in trusting the finished work of the cross. That's what he's saying. It's really a simple concept. It's kind of weird in how it gets translated, but that's what he's saying. Grace concept. Grace principle. These words, you did me no wrong, uh, is literally the words, you didn't hurt me. You haven't hurt me in the way you're living. This is interesting. He wants to make this very clear that they're choosing to go back under the law because of the Judaizers coming in and trusting their words, not Paul's words. These Galatian churches have chosen to separate themselves from what Paul taught them. And they have, because of that, chosen to come under the law once again. Paul's saying, can I tell you something? You haven't hurt me in doing so. What? Paul? What are you saying? He's saying, my heart is broken for you. But remember, in relationships of grace, in relationships of love, you're going to see something, is that you do not hold the sin of another person over their head. You're saddened for them. You're saddened for what the evil one is doing to them. You're saddened because of what is being twisted and shaped. And, and, and maybe they've even gone against the things that you've invited them into. But what you get to say to them is, I'm not going to hold that against you because Christ Jesus hasn't held it against me. That's what relationships of grace get to do. You see, this is so much bigger than your salvation. This is a way of seeing life. This is a way of experiencing Christ's love and Christ's grace for you so that you can say these kinds of words when people have totally disregarded what you have said, what you have informed them of, what you've guided them into. You can truly say to them, I, I'm befuddled, and I so long for you to get to receive this good news, but I want you to know I'm releasing you from the sin you've gotten to do against me. There's a word for this. Do you know what this word is? It's called forgiveness. 
called forgiveness. There's so much power in forgiving a person before God and not holding their sin or the thing they've done wrong against you. Do you know where the freedom comes? Paul's more free than they are. Because he said, I'm not going to, you know you didn't hurt me. I, like I've, I, I'm, I just deeply long for you to experience this. That's, that's a grace principle, and we see it here. Tracking? Verse 13, he goes on, You know that it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. He recalls back for them the moment he showed up. So this is a beautiful thing to do in a relationship that has been um, torn apart. It's a beautiful thing to do when you're, when you're working with someone whose marriage is falling apart. It's a beautiful thing to do is to invite them back into the beginning. To say, do you remember where it started? Do you remember those feelings of love and adoration and compassion for each other? Do you remember that moment? That's what he's doing. He's recalling. So it's, it's clear. We don't, we don't get a ton of information. We do know that Paul, throughout all of his missionary journeys, had some stuff going on. He had bad eyes at one point. He's, he's just had a ton. And he doesn't, he doesn't clearly outline it. It's like he doesn't have time for it. He's like, i got to get the gospel going. I don't even need to talk about my stuff. But it's clear that Paul had some flat-out issues. You know, you know, right around this same time, he was like literally stoned to death, but he like didn't die. Stones, like people dropping boulders on him. He might have been here because of that. He might have been on his way to Ephesus, but stopped here because he had boulders like thrown at him, and he's just recovering. And while he's there, he's like, oh, these folks don't know the gospel. And so he shares with them. We don't really know what ailment? Some believe he was suffering from, a, from, a, from what many suffered with in that region, which is a form of malaria that actually does damage to your eyesight. Many believe Paul had really bad eyes. Um, we, don't, we don't actually know, but what we do know is that he wasn't planning to go to Galatia, that his very coming was a gift of God's grace. And he's pointing that out. He's like, look, you weren't even part of the plan. Like, I showed up to you. I was a mess. But here's the most magnificent thing. You heard the words coming out of my mouth about this man named Jesus, and you received me as though I was a messenger from God. That's what he says to them. He goes, I was undone by the way you loved me and cared for me. And you did something. You did something when I showed up. You didn't take my ailment and then stereotype me into who you thought I was. You allowed the goodness of the Spirit of God to come out of me, and you trusted that above anything else. Do you understand, in this time, remember when he was shipwrecked, and there's these 200 uh, prisoners and murderers, and they were in this boat, and they got shipwrecked, and they go onto this land. Um, this is right by this region. These are the same type of people, and they get off the boat, and it's cold and wet and rainy, and Paul goes to grab some wood to make a fire. Do you guys remember this story? And he grabs the wood out of the wood pit and, and he goes to put it on the fire and it says that a viper attached himself to Paul's arm. And what did the people say immediately? They said, this man is cursed if that snake is biting him. He must have done something really wrong. You understand what he was saying to these people of Galatia? He's saying, look, when I showed up a mess with damage that had been done to me, with bad eyesight, whatever he was going through, you didn't hold that against me. You chose to see the Spirit of God within me. Do you, do you know what a gift that is? Do you know what a gift that is for a community like this? Do you know that we don't always believe these karma-related things, but that we do something similar often? Do you know that I've been taught by a, a lady named Marcia Kuiper, who happens to be my mother-in-law? She is unbelievably gifted at assuming the goodness of God in you before she even knows you. She comes up to you as though you are like God himself. And she greets you and she receives you. The word receive. She receives you before she even knows you. You could be an absolute hot mess and she would just bring you in knowing that the same spirit that was in her is in you. She just does that. What a gift that could be for such a place. And that's what we see here.
Cool? That's what relationships of grace do. Verse 15, he goes on. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. That's not helpful, by the way. Don't, you don't. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? What happens in communities and systems that put law or practice or behavior over love and grace is that even truth can't get to the heart sometimes. Do you, do you understand that we've gotten to witness that over this last year and a half? I, I say this, um, and I, I want to be careful with my words, but when we've removed Christ Jesus from the center and we've brought in outside practices or behaviors or whatever it is, and we've said these are the most important, do you know what happens? Is that often tri- times truth can't even be heard because these things are far more important than the truth. Right? And that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing all of a sudden law came in And now we've got a system for what's right and what's wrong and what's right and what's wrong and what's right and what's wrong. And And what does that do? Divides. Just does. It's a beautiful gift. If you ever divide people up, just tell them that they're doing things wrong. It'll work every time. But what grace does is it invites something beautiful. It invites us to be centered around the love of Christ Jesus. And when the love of Christ Jesus is in the center of the room, guess what? Whether you watch Formula One or watch Phil Mickelson or whatever you do, it does not matter. Christ is at the center. Do you know how different and weird we are in this room, in this very room? If we sat down and talked politics, we would like kill each other. If we sat down and talked anything outside of Christ, we would just go, what, are you crazy? But when you put Christ at the center of the room, there is love, there is freedom, there is relationship, there is kindness, there is goodness. And the moment that you let law or behavior or system sneak in and take priority of Christ Jesus, all of a sudden what you're going to see is you're going to see division. It just happens. Because remember, from the beginning, the evil one had a plan. And the plan was, if I can get human beings to try to control their own destiny by their own behavior, I, I, I can make this thing work. And that's what he continues to do. Do you know that um, this is going to sound contrary? Do you know that truth doesn't save people? Do you know that Jesus saves people? Do you know that Paul was teaching them truth and they couldn't hear it? They actually, they actually chose to make him their enemy because of truth. Jesus is what saves people. Don't get me wrong. Truth is good, but Jesus is more better. We need more truth, fine. But Paul's truth actually turned them away from truth. You see, truth established on anything other than the grace and love of Jesus turns into rule and rule following. But maybe did we forget that Jesus is the way, he is the truth, the truth, and he is the life. Verse 17, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you. This is, he's just trying to tell them, hey, these Judaizers, they actually don't have your best in mind. They, they know that they follow these rules, and so they've created a system of elitism. They want to invite you in because that means they have more converts and it looks like they're onto something. But at the end of the day, what they're doing is they're just putting you under them. They're just using you to elevate themselves. Don't don't be mistaken by what they're doing. Does that make sense? Should we keep rolling? Verse 19, he says this, My little children, 
from who I am again in anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. My little children, from whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until now, Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, but for now I'm perplexed about you. This is the only time, only time, this is the only time that the Apostle Paul, you know, he wrote like half of the New Testament. This is the only time that he calls those he's writing to my little children. It's the only time. John uses it all the time. John maybe stole it from him. He's like, I like that one. John wrote most of his stuff after Paul. It's the only time. It's the only time. Don't miss the tenderness in his voice. Some of the most profound words in this section would be, until Christ is formed in you. Until Christ is formed in you. I anguish. I, I labor over you. I labor over the relationship. I labor over you as a church. I labor over you as a people. I'm in anguish. I'm working really hard until Christ is formed in you. This word Christ is formed in you, don't, don't misplace it. Um, when you become a believer in Christ Jesus, you have the fullness of Christ Jesus. This is not talking about how at some point you'll have more Jesus than you have now. No, you have all of Jesus the moment you become a believer. What's he talking about? He's talking about what grace does. What relationships of grace do, what relationships of love do, what relationships under the umbrella of Christ do is that they woo the true nature that is within you, which is the nature of Christ Jesus. They, it woos that out of you so that that can be formed as to who you are. Do you know what the relationships based on law and behavior following do? Is they, they try to change you based off of condemning you. Right? They try to say, you're bad doing that, you're bad doing that, you're bad doing that, that's bad, that's bad, get better. Do you know that that doesn't pull the new nature of Christ out of you? Do you know what that does to you? It actually causes you to hide. But what relationships of love do is that they invite you into who you are. And when the relationship is not in jeopardy because love and Christ is at the center, it actually does something. This beautiful picture of Christ Jesus, his spirit within you, actually gets formed and comes out to play. Does that make sense? It's a beautiful gift when we can begin to create relationships built on Christ, him at the center, relationships on grace and love, what will happen is that that Christ who is full within you will be formed and moved out of you. It's a beautiful gift. It's a beautiful gift. It's not condemning, but it's releasing. It's this idea of sanctification. It's this idea of, of, of growing into the very thing that you already are because of what Christ has done in you. And the final thought for today is um, you can, yeah, stop, um, stop texting and using Facebook to exchange passionate thoughts. <laughs> Go take your friends out to coffee. Listen to even what Paul's saying. He's saying, look, I so wish I could just be with you guys right now and talk this through. I'm perplexed. I don't understand what went wrong. I don't understand how you're seeing it from that vantage point. I don't get it. Truly, I don't understand. Like you're confusing me by the way you're talking. I so wish that I didn't have to write this in words and that I could just go be with you. Guess what? We can go be together. I don't know where Paul was. I don't know what his situation was. He certainly didn't have Uber. He certainly didn't have plane flights. He certainly didn't have transportation. We do. Cho choose to enter into relationships of love, relationships built on grace, relationships built on Jesus Christ at the center and enter into those in a space where you can talk face to face. Because I'll tell you this, when the spirit of the living God, which is in you and which is in me, comes out to play together, it's a beautiful thing. I will tell you this right now, it will tear down walls. It will t remove those walls. It will remove that division because you will see each other and you'll go, oh my gosh, I love that person. I love that person. Can we try that? That'd be helpful. Let me pray for us. Lord, we go to the table now. And uh, 
You taught us something, Lord. You taught us a way. And you did it through the cross. You did it through your Son, God. And then it became manifested to us through your Spirit. You have taught us a way of love. You have taught us a way of grace. You have taught us a way of putting aside self for the benefit of others. And Lord, we do believe you're at the center. We believe because of your cross that day that everything changed, that we have been made new, that we have been made right, that we are no longer slaves, but we are children of yours. We believe that, Lord. And we believe as children that we are heirs to the blessing which is Jesus Christ, which has been found in our hearts. Lord, we long to be a people. We long to be a church. We long to be a community. We long to be parents and teachers that live out of this new reality of who you are and what you've done. We trust you with us, Lord. We give you our lives in Jesus' name. Amen.